Let me tell you from experience that the deep web is a disgusting human cesspit. You don't know what lies in the darkest recesses of the human psyche until you go on there. I learned that the hard way. I got suckered in by the crazy stories and the hype my friends gave it. I wanted to see it for myself. So, last week I downloaded Tor and started browsing. I didn't feel the need for any extra protection, being completely new to the entire concept. In retrospect, I wish I had. I spent hours clicking link after link after link, and I was starting to get bored and a little freaked out. I'd found a whole host of your typical crackheads searching for drugs, sites with hitmen for hire, and a shit ton of other military-grade weaponry. At one point I found myself scrolling through post after post of vivid descriptions of animal abuse, and how the sick fuckers who commit those atrocities get off on them every night. Shh, I wish I'd closed my computer right then and there, but something kept my curiosity alight. Honestly, I think some part of me just wanted to see how fucked up the human mind truly could be. After a few more links to child porn and a couple of drug markets, I'd had enough. This is it, I sighed to myself. One more link, and I swear I'm getting out of this hellhole. I clicked the link, going blindly into what, unbeknownst to me, would alter my already cynical views on humanity. The first thing that caught my eye was the curly pink font that served as the title of the opening page. It read, Peace and Love. I remember it all too clearly, as it seemed so out of place in that slum of human refuse, formerly known as the Deep Web. I scrolled down to find an image album and a simple chat box. No one was online at the moment, so I went ahead and clicked the first set of pictures. I was not ready for what I was about to see. The very first picture was that of a young, pregnant woman, bawling her eyes out. She looked scrawny and thin, with cuts and bruises marring her pale skin. She looked scared and malnourished, like she was begging for her life. I clicked on the next photograph and nearly vomited. The young woman from before now sat in a chair, facing the camera, her dead, dull eyes boring into me. She was covered in blood, and her abdomen had been torn open. In her cold, unfeeling arms, she held the child, still attached at the umbilical cord. Its half-formed, lifeless body was a deep crimson with blood and one could tell it had been forcibly ripped from the womb. On the wall just behind them, written in their blood, were the words, I gave them peace, in harsh, hasty letters. I don't know what possessed me to scroll through the photo. It was as if I couldn't control myself. The images only got more and more grotesque as I looked further. The following images seem to be a time-lapse of the decomposition of the body. I watched them rot, sitting there together. I watched the face of the mother, which could have once been considered beautiful, wither and collapse in on itself as a fetid mound of flesh. By the end of the series of images, there were nothing but decimated skeletons. I would have noped it the fuck out of there, had it not been for a message that popped up on my screen. It was from the website chat. It read exactly as follows. Hello there. 
Do you like what you see? Do you want more? Do you want to attain true peace? I didn't know how to respond. I was rooted to my chair with fear. Then the sicko spoke again. You don't have to be scared, Zachary. I love you. I want to help you. Let me help you. I managed to type a simple question. How in the name of hell do you know my name? Almost immediately, I got a response. I know everything about you. You know, you really shouldn't leave your curtains open like that. You'll get a draft. You see, I just want to help you. Please, just let me save you. My eyes flashed to the uncovered window behind me, to the light of my webcam. My heart skipped a beat when I realized it was on. That sick fucker was watching me. I made a move to pull the plug on the sick son of a bitch when another message popped up. Don't try to shut me out. I'll bring you peace. I swear, Zachary Tanner. It's the only real bliss in this world. That was the last message I got before I finally shut it off. Needless to say, I stayed off the internet for a long while after that. Just today I got back on, praying to God that it would all have blown over. <laughs> oh, how wrong I was. I logged into my email only to find it spammed with mails from an account named I'll Show You Peace. Each one had the same message. I want to save you. I want to love you. I want to bring you peace. All in capital letters. But that wasn't even the worst of it. Each and every message had a candid photo of me taken within the last week. I've tried to involve the police but they haven't been much help. Please tell me, what do I do? I've always had a really strong interest in what is commonly known as the Deep Web. Although the Deep Web has some good uses, it also has an incredibly dark side to it too. The Dark Web is a small corner of the Deep Web, containing the stereotypical content that the Deep Web is notorious for. I took my first steps into this little excavation of mine, into the darkest parts of anonymous sites, under the surface of the web, in an attempt to undermine the stereotype that the deep web is more of a home to dark, illegal websites than it is anything good. Well, I came out of this with more than I could ever have expected. And now my view on humanity in general has forever been changed. The start of my uh, trip took me quite a while, about three to four weeks, to get enough information to start really delving deep into what I will now refer to as the dark web. That small corner that is basically the house of horrors. Lots of talking around, honing information from chat rooms, and taking lots of notes. I even had to make a couple of phone calls to some more than shady individuals. Not a comfortable experience. 
by the end of my trek of gathering as much information as possible and getting a good contact list, I took my first steps into the outer layer of the dark web, so to speak. The hard part is that once you get deeper, a lot of sites have ever-changing URLs, extensive invitation queues, and, at times, pricey entrance costs that may or may not end up as cash spent on a phony operation. A lot of it is luck, meeting people at the right place and at the right time, and taking good notes. I had a good streak of luck, and took good notes, enough to get me to the places I entered. But what I did notice is that, once I got into the first site that I'll talk about, it became much easier to get into the other sites, as it was much more freely talked about, and information was passed around much more. Chat rooms in the dark web are basically an information honey hole. So, the first site, Centrix. Centrix was one of the more well-known general markets, so to speak. A good example to compare it to would be Agoratha or the Silk Road. Now, Centrix, from what I learned via lots of questions on the chat room over the course of a couple of days, has been around for about 11 months and has been untouched by any means of being shut down. Which surprises me, because it has everything from Agoratha or the Silk Road, but to a much greater extent, and a lot more variety. What some sites dedicate their whole selling product to be, Centrix had subcategories for. Just a few brief examples here. Snuff film. Bulk drugs, all varieties. Fake everything. IDs, licenses, you name it. A very censored section of CP. Various illegally obtained memberships. Netflix, pornography, and so on. And the list goes on. Another thing that is a bit chilling is the fact that they took a great effort to crack down on scams. The big deal on sites like Agoratha and Silk Road was that they had a lot of scam vendors. This site didn't. And they had a lot of proof to back it up that I will not go into detail on. I also met a guy in a chat room who was nice. <laughs> as far as that can go for an active dark web user like himself, who verified some of the links I'd collected and vaguely sent me in the direction of other sites for my personal use. This was a great help, and it led me to my next site, which, from the uh, illegality and general morals of the site, is what I consider the next layer, or gate, into the dark web. So, my second site, Brink Warehouse. Hey, a site with a normalish name. Brink Warehouse was actually quite fascinating. Not horrific to any great extent, but it did have a different kind of dark backlash. Brink Warehouse was a virtual warehouse of textual guides, notes, leaked documents, and torrented books, one that was released online a day after it was published by quite a popular author. Now, as a summary, this might seem alright, but take into account that the guides included things like how to make a drone-based homemade explosive, and how to kidnap adolescents in their sleep. Illegal leaked documents galore. Anywhere from US classified cases to foreign affairs. This also included guides on illegally modifying weapons, joining terrorist groups, 
guides to scripting and nulling bank accounts, and so on and so forth. Not a fun sight. The site I headed to next is where it starts to get really formally creepy. The site with no name. I got access to this site, which I consider to be the start of the darkest of the dark web, from a chat room user called Francis Stern 344 on Chit Chat, a very common deep web chat room site that most of you have probably already stopped off in. Well, talk comes to talk, and we end up on the topic of snuff films. How common they are, where they're usually filmed, and why, and so on. I gain his trust. We resume this chat in a private room that he had. Please, keep in mind that only getting information was my main reason for chatting. I am not into snuff films though they do fascinate me. We talked for a good twenty minutes before, without me having to even ask. He hooked me up with a site. Now, I'm just going to use a small portion of the URL to name it. So we're going to call this site 5611. Now, this site, 5611, required an invite extensive registration, questioning, and a one-on-one -on -one meeting with what I assumed was the site director or admin. This person was a harsh motherfucker, and the stern punishments for breaking the site's rules were laid out in full. The guy who invited me, Francis Turn 344, I guess was a long-timer on 5611, and had permission to let me take a tour of the site. Now, I did ask for a formal site name for future reference, but they said a title would only make it easier to identify them, which they did not want to happen. 5611 had a small membership that, he said, the runners of the site tried to cater to very fondly, as membership is approximately $350 a month. Upon entering the site, I had to check the Are You Older Than 18 box for the fifth time since I'd started signing up. Finally, I was in. The site's design was bland and blocky, with a pure white background and very blocky close-together writing. In the top right corner, there were options to log out, add funds to the balance, and then a small wallet emoticon that displayed an empty client-side balance. But those things were barely on my mind. My mind was on the center of the screen. In a single row down the center. Single frames with captions and a description took up most of the screen. The top one had a still of a table with various blades and blunt weapons laid out. The title, 24-year-old female, sleeping, suggestion, death, with a price tag along the side. A timer in green text was counting down, 11.51, 11.50, 11.49. Under the timer, in the same green font, was 78 out of 100. A couple of seconds later, the 78 turned into a 79. Realization hit me in the face like a bat. This was a paid snuff sight. With a shaky hand, I scrolled down through the seemingly endless snapshots and captions. One caught my eye. Quick watch. Homeless. 0 0.22 Bitcoin. Large view. Low quality. It was like an attention-whoring YouTube title, but it seemed to be working. In the eerie green font, 783 
out of a thousand was displayed, a jaw-dropping number in my eyes. I decided this needed to be documented, so I did a quick transaction, put 30 Bitcoin cents in my site wallet and clicked on the arrow to enter. It took a minute or two to complete the transaction, and after about a five minute buffer, I was in the showing. There was no chat box, only a slightly lighter border of grey and static. The same green timer was now in the bottom right of the screen. Three, two, one. The square blurred, revealing a city street. What seemed to be Arabic writing was on various shop signs and advertisements. Light from a street post gave a fuzzy glow to the scene. The cameraman, from the position of the camera, seemed to be leaning against a wall. The shot focused on a dinky red junker on the street's curb. From the side of the camera's view, a gloved finger points towards the entrance of a dark alley where a man lays on his side, like a breathing pile of rags, obviously homeless and alone. The finger makes a motion towards the car, and three men quietly exit the car and walk along the storefronts towards the sleeping homeless figure. The quality is totally shit, but the scene can still be made out and is enhancing my horrid imagination about what is to come. About five meters from the homeless victim, the lanky group of thugs pull out plain white theater masks from their jackets, take out various small weapons, and pounce around the corner onto the innocent, unsuspecting victim. The camera picks up the quick shuffling of feet as the cameraman runs towards the scene, catching the thugs thrashing and stomping the man from his slumber. Cut him up! The cameraman's thickly accented voice commands the thugs, who begin to slash the victim at a wild speed, like hyenas tearing into caught prey. Blood sprays onto the wall and onto the thugs' white masks. It is horrible. My stomach barely holds on. I can't take it. Logging off tour. I take a few more security measures and shut off my computer, taking some deep breaths and sipping from a cause light. Now, on to my last visit to the dark web, Candy Palace. I logged on about a week later and never even thought to go back on 5611. I never contacted anyone from my past sites, and I knew in my heart that this would be my last visit to any site on the deep web. I was thoroughly motivated to not go on, because with 5611, that had really been in my mind to be the last straw. I'd proven to myself that the dark web, even though it has some good parts, is really just a beacon of humanity's horrific actions. I'd proven to myself that sites like 5611 and others do exist, but I just felt the need to cover the last huge part of the dark web that is, in my mind, the worst of it all. Child pornography. Candy Palace is a huge site. Do some digging and get some sources, and unfortunately, you will find it. From the videos, I've come to the conclusion that it is all hosted in one location in a foreign country. I always wondered that if there are all these snuff films and child sex slave dungeons that are often spoken about, that there would have to be a suitable amount of missing children cases and unsolved murders to go along with them. 
Some research and asking around concluded that many of the film murders and child porn director rings are in fact in foreign countries. Where getting away with these kinds of actions is a piece of cake, in the words of an aspiring director in a Candy Palace chat room. I will not go into specific detail about any one video on Candy Palace. I'll only lay down some basic stats and descriptions, and let you find the rest if you so please. The main chat room had several hundred chatters in total, between the various subchats. They actually had a very detailed profile of each child. An example was Tatasa. Nine years old, black hair, and then include a list of, if I remember correctly, 83 videos she starred in and counting. The children were usually smothered in makeup and, besides for what seemed like a designated two or three stars, not extremely physically hurt via evident meeting. <sighs> Double penetration, binding. Gay. Forced one-on-one, -on -one, knife, roleplay, chamber, and dungeon were the top video tags. Each video had one or two tags. If I remember correctly, there were a total of 17 stars. Nobody ever brought up anything about whether they were kidnapped, imported, or imprisoned. All anyone cared about was watching. So getting information on that topic was hard. There were no grimy bedrooms or warehouses or basements. Nothing that fits the common stereotype. Most of the scenes were filmed in various sets, such as era-style dungeons or surgery rooms. It was basically Pornhub with a pink, white, black colour scheme and 6-12 to 12 year olds. It is a nightmare. Conclusion. I never look at people the same. Throughout doing this research-oriented trip through the dark web, my view on humanity has changed. Every video I watched in the name of research chinked away at my emotions, often leaving me crying. My curiosity broke me, and it's taken me nearly a year to fully recover. This story constitutes, I guess, my case file for my research on this subject. Now, before you launch Tor and find these sites, please know this. There is nothing enjoyable, entertaining, or at all suitable on this network. You will be left in tears. You will be scarred. And worst of all, you will never view others the same again. So, depending on how much you actually use the internet, you might know of something called the Deep Web. Pretty much you can use proxy service like Tor or I2P and find all kinds of stuff you normally wouldn't find, like places to buy guns or drugs. Anyways, I was browsing an Ask Reddit thread about weird stuff on the internet, and a few people mentioned dot .onion site. Interested by all this, I decided to download Tor and look up a list of sites to visit. I found one site advertised as a black market. I thought this was pretty cool, so I decided to browse around. People were selling meth, guns, hits on other people, and stolen goods. I was about to leave, but then a post titled, Free For You, caught my eye. 
I clicked on the thread and all the post said was, Lots of fun for you. Free download. Enjoy. Below the text was a link to a file called fun.zip. Now, keep in mind, it was like 2am and I was really bored. So I downloaded the file and ran it through a few virus scans. Nothing came up, so I decided to unarchive it. Inside were a lot of videos and pictures. I decided to click on one called bananaman.avi, and I watched it. Not too much to it, just some guy in a banana suit for four minutes. I was interested enough, though, to keep on going. So I clicked on a picture called steven.jpg. <laughs> it was just some guy sitting at his computer looking bored. I opened a few more pictures with people's names on them, and they were almost all the same. Just someone sitting at their computer looking bored or doing something like carrying books or walking into a store. I was getting a bit creeped out, but I decided to press on. I watched a couple more videos. One was some kids walking to school. Another was a man reading the newspaper on his couch. I'll uh, skip to the more interesting ones now. Goodnight.avi Two boys, maybe like seven or eight, are brushing their teeth in their pajamas. They seem completely unaware of the camera, as it's filmed from right beside them. They finish brushing and rush off to bed. For the next nine hours, it views them sleeping. Nothing else. Payment.avi A middle-aged man is walking down a dimly lit street during the middle of the night. Again, this person is also completely unaware of the camera. He comes across a teenage girl and begins talking to her. The sound is muffled, but it must be bad due to the growing look of terror on the girl's face. She tries running, but gets shoved into the wall by the man. He grabs a phone and backpack and runs off. The video goes on for four minutes of the girl sobbing in the street, and then ends. Stolen.avi A teenage couple is seen watching a football game at what is, presumably, their high school. The game ends and the crowds leave, except for the couple who decide to remain at the bleachers. Once everyone leaves, the couple kisses a couple of times, and then the boyfriend whispers something into the girl's ear. She keeps saying no, but he keeps on saying, come on, and it'll be fun. All my friends have done it with their girlfriends. The girl tries to leave, but is grabbed by the boy. At this point, everyone that was at the game has left, and the field is mostly dark. The girl's boyfriend slams her against the back of the bleachers and takes off her pants. He begins to violently rape and beat her for the next 15 minutes. The girl has a black and bloody nose and is sobbing on the ground. Her boyfriend begins to stomp on her head and kick her in the stomach. Some gurgling noises are heard from the girl, but after a couple more stomps, they stop. Her head is completely stomped in, and her clothes are covered in blood. The boy dumps her body in a trash can behind the bleachers, along with the clothes, puts on his PE uniform, and walks away. The camera points at the trash can for 15 minutes, then the video ends. At this point I was completely freaked the fuck out and deleted the archive and decided to go to sleep. I fell asleep almost instantly, but didn't have any dreams at all. I went to school and didn't tell anyone what I'd seen. Lots of people asked me why I looked so freaked out. I just said I was on edge because I didn't sleep a lot last night. I was beginning to think that I'd just had a nightmare 
I was taking things way too seriously. After lunch, though, I felt my phone vibrate. It was a text from a number listed as unknown, saying, You like? I tried to call, but it always just got a busy signal. I figured it was just a wrong number, and didn't let it bother me. Things were pretty normal for a few days, until Thursday came around. I got another text from unknown, except this time it was a picture. It was a picture of me in my third hour class. I instantly freaked out and went on a computer to try to find the post I'd seen on Sunday night. I looked everywhere but the thread was nowhere to be found and no one was talking about it. More pictures started rolling in. Some were of me, others were of my friends, my family, and some people I didn't even know. I went to the police and they said they would try to trace the number, but they considered it low priority, so it would take a couple of days. I texted all my friends, asking if they were playing some kind of fucked up joke on me. No reply. I tried calling them and it just went straight to voicemail. I decided I would just go home and look into my browser history to find the post, so I called my mum. Again, just straight to voicemail. Even though I lived pretty far from the police station, I decided to run home like my life depended on it. I got home, turned on my computer, and saw just one file. Morefun.zip. With great fear, I opened up the file, and inside were pictures and videos of all my friends and family being tortured and mutilated. Images of my mum with her eyes ripped out and impaled on sharp metal rods. My friends with their jaws ripped off, fingers cut off and jammed into their eyes, and videos of them being burned alive. I was going to call the police, but one more image caught my eye. It was entitled Hello.jpg, created about 15 seconds ago. It was me looking at the images with a man with blood splattered clothes standing behind me with a camera, smiling. This story happened to my friend just one week ago. To give you some context, this is the friend that showed me how to get onto the deep web. Now, he's always been really fascinated with it. But after my horror story experiences with deep web hackers, he decided to take a pretty long break. He didn't resume using the deep web until about a year after hearing about my experiences but he didn't tell anyone. He would buy stolen Apple products, drugs, and so on. Now, about a week or two ago, he was buying some cocaine. It wasn't from the seller he normally buys from, though. Basically, it was really cheap. So he gave the seller his address and a fake email he used, so he could stay in contact until the deal was done. He wasn't too worried, this guy seemed professional, and it was the same procedure for most of his purchases. My friend told him to ship it in a movie case, or something that his mum wouldn't expect to find drugs in. This was probably his biggest mistake. He let the man know he was just a teenager. But then again, my friend isn't the most careful of people. A few days later, his mum walked into the house and handed my friend a movie he'd ordered online. He took it and opened it up. But inside there wasn't any cocaine, 
just a piece of folded up paper. He opened it up and read it. There has been a problem. Email me for details. At the bottom, the man had left a new email for my friend to contact. My friend got on his email and asked the guy what the problem was. He responded, Something has happened. If I were to send it to you, it could be traced back to me, and we would both be caught. Meet me at the elementary school at seven. We'll just do it in person. Now, the school wasn't too far away, so my friend told his mom that he was staying the night at my house, and he headed off to meet the man. He called me and asked if I could be there with him, but I was really busy with my schoolwork, so I said I couldn't. I did tell him to take a knife or something, though, just in case things went wrong. When he got to the parking lot outside the school, he heard a car honking its horn. He saw it was a jeep, but the plate had been covered up by duct tape, and the windows were tinted very dark. The man got out of his car and gave my friend the drugs, and my friend paid him. It seemed like everything had gone fine. My friend got in his car and sat there a bit in order to call and tell me that everything was fine. He noticed that when he'd hung up though, the man was still there. Why was he waiting? He didn't think too much of it and drove off. When he got to the first red light, he noticed that the man's car was right behind him. He started to get a little nervous, but kept driving. When he reached his neighborhood, the man was still following him, so he decided it would be a bad idea to lead him to his house. He instead turned into the next neighborhood and took a whole bunch of random turns, hoping to lose the man. Eventually, he no longer saw the car, so he pulled the car into his garage and called it a day. That night, he noticed the sound of a car engine. He looked out of his window and saw the man's car parked in his driveway. He got wide-eyed and snuck downstairs and peered through the window. Inside the car, the man was smoking a cigarette and talking on the phone. But in the passenger seat, he also saw a second man. The second one was a lot more suspicious looking, even more so than the shady drug dealer. This second one had messed up hair, a trashy shirt, and, while it was hard to see, my friend could almost make out a scar from a massive burn on the side of his neck and on his face. He kept watching the two men until the second man began to look at the window more and more often. Eventually, he was just staring at the window my friend was watching him from. My friend decided he'd had enough and was going to call the cops. He didn't care if he would get in trouble at this point, so he moved away from the window and called the police, who told him to grab a weapon or something to defend himself and to wait for them to arrive. He waited for about five minutes when he saw a figure quietly come out of his mom's room, who was still sleeping. This man shut the door behind him and noticed that my friend had seen him. The figure sprinted towards my friend with what looked like a knife raised in his hand. My friend grabbed a pot from the nearby table and threw it at the figure. It hit him in the face and shattered. The figure screamed and fell to the floor. My friend turned on the lights and saw the second man with the burn on his face, rolling around on the floor. His face was covered in blood and shards of glass were sticking out. His right eye had tons of blood pouring out of it. He must have been hit pretty hard. As the man began to slowly get up, my friend grabbed a kitchen knife and drove it into the man's shoulder, causing the man to scream again. The man began to stumble over to the front door, when police sirens could suddenly be heard. Both men were caught on sight, but my friend's mum 
had been killed. Her throat had been slit, and she had 23 stab wounds and duct tape covering her mouth. My friend was arrested too for drug possession. His trial is coming up. But the worst of all is that he lost his mom because of his deep web experience. So I don't think he'll be buying drugs from the deep web ever again. The Deep Web, a seemingly endless landscape of hidden sites and digital media, which can't be reached by conventional web browsers. Sure, anyone can explore the Deep Web with the right tools, but without a proper roadmap, so to speak. You might find your computer taken over by malicious software, or stumble across something much, much worse. That's what reportedly happened to a former police employee named Mark Spielman. This is his story, allegedly written himself, as found in a Word document on his office computer's hard drive, shortly after he was reported missing. Also found was a case file of police documents, to which was clipped a handwritten note containing just three words. Who is Janice? A self-described introvert who seldom ventured outside the confines of his home, Mark prided himself as an expert in exploring the darker corners of the web. I know the internet inside out, he wrote. I just sit by my computer and look for fucked up shit. I'm well versed on all the current memes, YouTube fads, <laughs> and the best porn sites. But his knowledge extended way beyond that. It just so happened that someone with his particular skill set was needed by the local police department to assist in criminal investigations where critical evidence might be hidden in undisclosed locations on the deep web. Mark saw it as a great opportunity to get paid for what he already did all day long. The job began with tracking sites and secret networks, alleged to share child pornography and other concealed illegal activity, which is, unfortunately, quite common to the deep web. Mark could track down just about any user, even those who hid behind multiple proxies and the evidence he uncovered helped the department crack several difficult cases. His work even extended to tracing perps who hacked into police databases to alter evidence and other information. Then, one fateful day, everything changed for the worse. He began when he found what he believed to be one of the largest child porn rings ever discovered. Tracing a single lead the URL Suite 15 led him to a virtual warehouse of depravity. Mark saw an opportunity to become a hero by helping the police shut down such a huge criminal operation. Selfishly, he also saw a means to a big fat bonus and possible promotion. As he began investigating further, Mark saw dozens of links to image files each marked with a name. Katie.jpg Peggy.jpg Jessica.jpg Holding his breath, he clicked on one of these links labeled Kathy.jpg He was presented with the photo of a girl around 15 to 16 years old standing in a dimly lit room smiling faintly. The photographer did not depict the girl in a sexual way, nor did she appear to be nervous or threatened. Mark prepared to move on to the next link, when he noticed the URL corresponding to the image. It read not kathy.jpg, but janice.jpg. Puzzled, 
he tried another image link, this time susan.jpg. He got the same result. The same photo of the smiling young girl he saw before, again under the URL janice.jpg. Mark's confusion turned to unease as he clicked more and more links each one leading to the same picture of Janice. By the end of the day, he had clicked on hundreds of links, both to images and video, but each and every link opened the same page. That night, he began to worry that there was something more going on at Sweet 15 than a subversive redirecting of links. His instincts told him they were hiding something even more horrible. Unable to shake his obsession, Mark decided to use his home computer to dig into the deepest picture file locks he could find on the site. That's when he saw, on the last page of the logs, the single file name, truejanice.jpg. Nervously, he clicked on it. His computer immediately erupted into a flurry of critical error messages before completely freezing. He restarted the machine, only to discover that it had been infiltrated by an extremely malicious application, which deleted every one of Mark's pre-existing files and replaced them with hundreds of newly downloaded images. If Mark had any doubt, that he had meddled with something truly dangerous. That doubt was obliterated when he saw that his desktop screen was now the image of the same young girl. But this time, the photo was different. Janice was not smiling anymore. She looked scared. Nevertheless, Mark pressed onwards hands trembling as he tried to open one of the many image files now residing on his computer. The image of Janice popped up, but this one was also different. The girl was clearly horrified, her look of distress replaced by one of panic. The room in which she was sitting was also much darker. He clicked on another image. This time Janice seemed to be photographed while preparing to scream. Each subsequent image revealed a progressively more horrifying scenario, with the girl's expression turning from terror to agony, and the room became darker and darker, until finally there was nothing but a black screen. This continued for several more files. But Mark kept on opening the images until he saw something that made him recoil in horror. The photo showed a small, candle-lit room, unfurnished except for a single bed. On the wall behind the bed were smears of what could only be blood. On the bed, wrapped in a blood-soaked blanket, is what seemed to be a human body. Mark kept on clicking, and that's when he saw the man. The large male figure was standing over the bed, his face hidden from the camera, and was shown reaching for the stained blanket. In the next image, he pulled the cover back to reveal Janice, tied to the bed frame. At first, Mark thought she was dead, but the next image indicated that she was still very much alive and apparently regaining consciousness after an unknown length of time. The man was now standing by the bed, arranging a tray of sharp implements. Mark seemed to be on autopilot, horrified by what he saw, but unable to stop progressing through the images, even though he knew what was coming. Even as the man began to use the instruments of pain and death on his bound victim, even after it was clear that Janice was dead from blood loss, severe trauma, or both, 
Mark continued, clicking on one image after another. Toward the end of the list, most of the JPEG images were solid black again. However, by the second to last file, Mark was shocked to see Janice facing the camera as she had in the beginning. But this time, her eyes were sunken, her skin drained of color, and her face dotted with dried blood. Mark knew that Janice was dead, but somehow, he also knew that she was staring directly at him. He clicked the final file and was met with a single line of text. Who is Janice? According to the police report, Mark's documentation of the entire ordeal is the only evidence police found on his computer. The hundreds of files which he claimed to have seen were missing, and police could find no trace of the Sweet 15 directory he'd been allegedly investigating. The report also states that Mark disappeared after he'd left work that day, and to this date, his whereabouts are still unknown. Further documentation relating to the case was finally uncovered, including the possible identity of Janice. Her name and description matches that of a missing girl at the center of an unsolved, 20-year-old kidnapping investigation, in which the missing girl's parents had also mysteriously disappeared. Police also found one file on Mark's work computer, which had previously eluded their examinations. The original image of a sweetly smiling girl, marked Janice.jpg. Further analysis of the image allegedly revealed several hundred lines of embedded and encrypted code. After weeks spent deciphering it, experts discovered a link to a single video file. The contents of that video were promptly marked as classified, and no details have ever been made public. Shortly after this classification, the case of Mark Spielman's disappearance was closed. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>